I don't think this guy needs much <laughs> introduction, but in case you don't know, Dave Kennedy, he's uh, president and CEO, Trusted Tech, also Binary Defense Systems, which is pretty awesome. Um, creator of DerbyCon, which is also an awesome con. If you haven't been, you should, well, I would co say. Co-creator. Co-creator, sorry. You should try to go, but they're all sold out for like the next five years, so you can't get in, so. Um, <clears throat> what else can we say about Dave? He loves Hornsby, he loves pranking me. He yeah. Clowns. He loves he loves clowns. clowns. He loves clowns. clowns. I mean, if anyone's got clown stuff here, you should definitely have it out during this talk. He loves clowns. Oh, we have clown stuff. Perfect, because Dave loves clowns. So we have a lot of clowns here. Great. But Dave is talking. I got the title right here: The Wizard of Oz, painting a reality through deception. Everyone, welcome Dave Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you coming. The whole uh, clown thing was interesting because uh, I've been in the industry for, for quite a while, and uh, I'd, no one knew my secret about having issues with clowns. And uh, you know, the, the whole story is when I was a kid, my mom decorated my entire room with clowns, like clown you know sheets and clown wallpaper and clown everything. And I saw the movie It on accident, and then. Uh, <laughs> Totally jacked me up. But what was funny is no one knew in the industry, and uh, my dad is a, a sysadmin for a school district and presented at DerbyCon. And of course, he told the entire audience and the rest of the world basically that I was terrified of clowns. And so, literally, if you go to my Facebook uh, profile, there's literally like random horrible clown pictures like every day. People texting me horrible clown pictures. In fact, uh, one of my good friends, Khalil, I don't know if he's in here or not, but uh, Khalil actually um, ordered um, five clowns to follow me around in Vegas for, fi for a few days. <laughs> But the good news is, oh jeez, seriously, what the heck is it? Where did you get those from? We got shirts. That's amazing. Oh, those shirts? Yeah. I thought it was like a sticker. <laughs> no, that was oh, okay. <laughs> oh, what? Who does that? I'm all nervous. Oh, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's amazing. Uh, so I guess I'm going for president and I'm going to be a clown running mate here. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. But anyways, before the whole clown thing happened, uh, I got wind of it uh, because it was supposed to happen the next day. So I ordered uh, 16 tarantulas from an overnight uh, tarantula place because the person I was going through was terrified of spiders. Um, and I was just going to put it in his hotel room and see what happened. <laughs> and he got wind that I did that, so then we canceled it and we were like, okay, we're never going to prank each other again and made a truce because uh, we'll continue to try to one-up each other and it just wouldn't go good. But anyways, um, I'm Dave. Uh, celebrated our first win for the Cavaliers. Any Warriors fans here? Boo. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, what's neat about uh, what I want to talk about today is, um, you know, this tech, the, the topic that I'm talking about is more so understanding who you're going after, how you build things in a way that is believable. And what's interesting is all of the information that um, we typically use to go after individuals are readily available online. Um, and building our attack vectors just takes a little bit of time, caress, and uh, a little bit of care and feeding to actually go and get into an organization and compromise them. <clears throat> what's really neat is uh, most recently uh, Set was on the uh, Mr. Robot TV show, so that was really cool. Yeah. Mark Rogers, thank you for that. <coughs> It's neat when you, you're sitting there watching and like, oh, that's, that's my tool. That's really cool. And it's like hacking into stuff and, you know, neat. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting about uh, this topic too is, you know, if you look at kind of the shift around what we've been talking about in security, and I remember when Chris and I were hanging out in an IRC chat room, like, how many years ago, Chris? Ten? Ten years ago, 12 years ago. You know, we're like, hey, the social engineering thing is going to be a really big thing and, uh, you know, we're going to see it, you know, kind of uh, take over as far as um, statistics and what we see as far as breaches and things like that. And that's where social-engineer.org was formed and all that other good stuff. You know, the mindset has kind of changed and, and, you know, you look at, at the red team and the red team's always like, oh, hey, you have to be 100 or we're always 100 percent effective and the blue team only needs to miss things once. And we're starting to see the shift of that of where the blue team, you know, when an actual breach occurs, the blue team uh, only needs one way of detecting an attacker uh, to actually identify a breach as it happens. So it's starting to shift a little bit. But what's interesting about this one is with social engineering, uh, it's very difficult in a lot of cases to understand the initial intrusion or the compromise. And that's the, the scary part about what we do. Um, and I'll talk a little about um, the most effectiveness of that. Based on our own company data, uh, if you look at a lot of the breaches that we've done um, and done investigations over, 82% endpoint compromises, 14% perimeter. 
So if you look at most of the um, highest risk factors that you have out there, it's going to be your endpoints themselves. Uh, you know, clicking on a link or opening a browser. Um, the phone stuff doesn't happen as much, uh, at least we don't see it from our data, but most of it's, you know, targeted spear phishing attacks, uh, going after um, individual organizations. And so that's kind of how uh, we see most of the breaches happen today. So it's interesting to see, like, you know, 12 years ago when social engineering was kind of a topic but not something that was very popular yet in InfoSec to where we see it now as one of the most prominent and most reliable methods for exploitation. And it's cool because I mean, it's a good testament to the security industry because it looks like we've gotten a lot better on the perimeter. Um, if you actually look at the data, it just means that it's much easier to hack the users than it is to go after and understanding, you know, SQL injection and everything else out there. So high return, low investment uh, for social engineering. You don't have to be awesome at what you do. Um, you could just, you know, create a craft a, a somewhat of a believable scenario and hopefully they click a link. So I'm going to walk you through how social engineering attacks work uh, in general and a little bit about how I go after and, and break things down, uh, which is what I, I um, find as being most effective for what I do. Uh, first and foremost, everything that we do is completely magic. Um, there's nothing to do with, with anything else other than that. But we are creating a fantasy in some way. We have to create something that um, allows the user to believe that what they are doing is legitimate and it's an action that is authorized or that uh, they believe that they are going to be rewarded in some way or something that is in the normal confines of business operations of who you're going after. And what's interesting is if you look at individual people, individual people are much harder to hack than an entire company because an entire company has, you know, hundreds, thousands, 10,000, 100,000 employees. So you can just, you know, create multiple pretexts and until you get a successful one, you know, you finally, you know, get access to somebody, now you have access. You have an, an unlimited source to go after organizations. And what's interesting is that a lot of the shift has gone from the education awareness piece to more technology and more restrictive technology of stopping those types of breaches. You have, you know, tools that do virtualization and sandboxing. You have, you know, all these endpoint uh, software visibility things. And none of those really stop us when it comes to what we do as attackers. And so there's a, a blend in the gap right now around what we have uh, for, this type of, uh, for these type of techniques. <clears throat> so the first thing you need when you go after an organization is creativity doing your homework and identifying your, your target, uh, building a threat model about how you're going to go after an organization, attack, and then from there, uh, persistence and exfiltration of data. Now, my, my favorite is looking at an organization of who I'm going to target. You know, the easiest route to typically go is the IT folks, right, because they have elevated access into infrastructure. But a lot of times they're much more savvy on what's actually happening. So if you're going to go after IT folks, you have to build something that's very believable in some way, shape, or form that they would be incentivized to do or um, could be something else. And I'll actually show you an example uh, that I did on CNN uh, last year here at DEF CON uh, where it was a super easy uh, uh, hack where we broke into a company in less than 10 minutes and uh, had full access to their infrastructure and their IT person, which is a, a help desk admin. But you know, in those types of situations, you know, depending on who you want to go after really depends on how you're going to build your pretext. One of the, the most rewarding ones that we find like this one works all the time for us, is if we do a survey. Now surveys themselves are nothing, but you give them a $10 reward for once they complete the survey and you will get a very high success rate. $10 is about the, the, the break even point where people think it's real. You start going like $3,000, people are like, yeah, okay, that's not going to happen. Or like, hey, you have a chance of winning a million dollars, it's not going to happen, right? But you know, you get a $10 gift card at you know, a gas station or Target or wherever for completing a specific thing. And what's great is if you're actually attacking the company that is a retail chain of some sort and you say you're going to give them a gift card for that entire store, they'll, they'll do it. They believe it's part of the, the entire organization. So you know, health and benefits surveys, um, you know, employee satisfaction surveys, all of those work very well. Uh, health benefits are also a great target as well whenever you can target specific individuals with health benefits. All of these are common key things that you can build um, that, that if you can reward somebody and actively go and do it, they will click on something, they will open a link, they will do whatever they need to in order to get that $10 reward. So usually if you look at kind of the life cycle of an attack and how we typically go after an organization, uh, you know, through and throughout, is we typically start off with defining what our targets are going to be and who we're going after. And that's important because a lot of times when you go after an organization, especially if they're large ones, uh, they could have subsidiaries in place, uh, folks that, that don't necessarily equate to the corporate policy um, of corporate. What I'll find in most companies is that their, their corporate uh, infrastructure is somewhat locked down, they follow policies and things like that. But if they're, let's just say, you know, a retail chain that has, you know, store locations, they're usually not compliant as much as 
corporate, if they're international, different regions have more security than not. So if you look at those different regions or different subsidiaries that they have or different branches that aren't necessarily there, banks are a good example, branch locations. Branch locations usually have good physical security, but when it comes to actual electronic or information security, they don't necessarily follow the same standard as the, the corporate infrastructure, especially in large organizations. So looking at who you're going to target and the best method for getting into an infrastructure is super important because that allows you to start to develop what types of techniques and attacks you're going to use. Once you find that, the recon and intelligence gathering. My favorite thing to do is, is go and browse LinkedIn. LinkedIn, we all love talking about ourselves. We are ego-centric people. We know we want to put our experience down because if I ever leave this job, I want to get another job. So I know exactly when you did your ArcSight implementation, how mature your semantic endpoint product is, you know, all of this other stuff that you have for defenses, so that I know that before I even touch your systems, what you're actually leveraging from a defensive perspective. What's great is like uh, also looking at um, recently um, connected uh, people within LinkedIn and like recommendations that you have. You have like someone from like FireEye. FireEye be like, hey, this company is great. It's awesome working with them, you know, all this other stuff, you know, and they give you recommendations. Sales guys are great because now I know you have fire, right? And I know when you purchased it, you know, when you had it implemented and, and ultimately what I have to do to get around it. And so you can find all that information online, start to build uh, what defenses you have or uh, what defenses they have in order to start getting a lot of their information they're targeting. And then from there you build or buy a tool um, or use a tool, an open source tool. This is interesting because you, you, we've seen a lot of shift towards the exploit kit market. Um, what was interesting about the whole ransomware and the exploit kit um, movement is you know, the, the retail chains were getting breached left and right. So you saw Target and Home Depot and Jimmy John's and all those other ones. And so the whole retail space started freaking out and employing real time encryption uh, for when you actually swipe your thing. So more hardware device encryption that happens when you're swiping it. EMV's literally done nothing, I don't think, aside from like being able to do in person fraud. But even that, we're still just doing chip and sign, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but you, know, you look at that, and so the retailers got a little bit um, better, a little bit better, not a lot, a little bit better, um, and it became much harder to get access to bulk credit cards. And so you had that whole market that was developing like Black POS and all these other tools, and they started focusing on um, other things like exploit kits and ransomware to be able to get money and do those things and license those out. And what's awesome is you can go online and buy an, an exploit kit for anywhere between 300 bucks to a grand or a couple others that have everything already packaged for you. So if I'm not a good hacker, I know what I need to do to go and buy a tool that will have an exploit in it that is vulnerable to you know, a specific company. And what's great is you know, most exploits, you know, especially when it comes to like Java or Adobe Flash or things like that, there's not a really good patch management process in a lot of the different organizations. So you have a very good subset of, of attacks that you can leverage um, inside the company itself. And so once you do that, um, you build an attack profile about how you're going to actively go in there. And this is where you start to build, you know, more of your actual um, attack itself. You know, what am I going to do to impersonate? How am I going to impersonate? Who am I going to impersonate? And who am, who am I going to be? And those are all important things because it allows you to start to be able to start to build that fantasy around who you're going to actually go and target. You know, what's great is, is companies provide so much information on their marketing websites, things that are happening, you know, if they're doing United Way, you know, um, you know, fundraisers, things like that, things that allow you to build things that are relevant that the company then publishes out. I often will send probes into the company, um, things that, that like for example, if I'm trying to impersonate somebody within the company, I'll send an email to somebody public facing, like a PR person or salespeople are great, just to get an email back so I can see what that email looks like, how they format their emails, the fonts, the logos, the disclaimers, all that other stuff so that I can make things look believable before I actually go and send things in. So those are all key things that I typically do uh, before I actually launch any type of attack, just more exploratory to see what's actually happening out there. You know, what's interesting though is if, it, if a company is business to business, I find that they're, they're by far the easiest for me to social engineer as an organization because I just create a business that's in their market space that they want to go to and say I have an insane budget that I need to spend by the end of next month for my quarter and those salespeople will do anything that you want to. Like literally you can have them hopping on one foot while clicking run this virus and they'll be cool with it as long as they're going to get the sell. So you know, business to business is very easy uh, when it comes to things. Um, you know, business to B2C, like consumers, are a little bit more difficult, but not as much. Um, you need to know a little bit more about what you're doing, um, opening fake accounts, things like that. Um, those are all you know, things that you have to start to prep for ahead of time to, to try to get them to click on things. Um, what's great is um, places you can go into store locations and actually do things like uh, retail stores or places you know, that allow you to actually walk in physically. Those are always great as well. Uh, but anyways, you know, starting to build your attack profile and what you're going to actively go and do. And then from there, you know, testing detection. What's interesting about this phase is I usually skip this one because I already know enough about the company's detection capabilities that I've already built everything uh, into them. 
Good example of that is the HTA attack vector, which I'll show you here in a second, which I still use very heavily. Um, there's a lot of there's a there's a number of ways um, to get access to an organization. You know, Excel macros, I guess, has been kind of like the the new old hotness, but that is kind of going away. Um, and so you have other methods too, like uh, Windows Diagnostics is a great way of being able to get um, direct access without even having uh, Microsoft Excel or anything like that installed. Uh, but HTA files are also the new old hotness. HTA files are something that has been around for since like the, the mid to late 90s when people were using it for exploiting and they still work very effectively today. It's basically like Java without having to have Java installed. It looks like it's Windows inst uh, trying to open up a Windows document um, on your machine and that's fine. I mean, most people will click open or okay on that. Now what's interesting of that one is like things that, um, that would typically get picked up by um, traditional things like um, FireEye for example or other things. You can build your attack vector so that you have things like parameters and things like that that get called that when FireEye goes to investigate it, it's like, oh, I don't know, this doesn't do anything because you're not feeding it any of the parameters. And then you can go and exploit it when it goes and in, in, in attacks the system. So there's a lot of things that you can do ahead of time uh, to get around those and making sure you have your, your resources. And then you get for the actual deployment of your, your attack vector infrastructure, command and control infrastructure. A lot of times what I do is I'll um, have my main exploit site where I fish everybody from, you know, like website attack vectors in one place and I pipe my shells to another place and then I have a secondary sh uh, place that I pipe other shells to. So when they compromise, what happens in most incident response scenarios is they'll, they'll be like, okay, you know, this box here is what was used for the fish, so let's block that IP address. But they don't look at where the shells are going and I'll register domain names that look legitimate like businessweekly.com or, you know, whatever ends up being, you know, the different websites that look like legit traffic and I do all 443 and, you know, HTTPS uh, communications and so they block that one and I still have another one. But I also offload shells to another machine that is out there just to make sure in case they, they block those I still have a little bit of, of persistence hooks in the environment to do what I need to. So that's all, all key things that I do. And then you can do the initial intrusion, uh, sending the fish out. This is an important piece for me. Um, when I actually send a fish out, I only send it to one person at a time now. I don't even do like two or three or four or five, I send it to one person and I wait. And the reason for that is if you build your pretext good enough, you will have somebody that will click it and you don't want to trigger the, any type of radar. So if I send it to 50 people, what are the chances that someone is like that, that might be in part of marketing or maybe part of another different location? You start to get higher probabilities of detection when that actually occurs. So I'll only send it like one person and I'll just wait. You know, I'll wait an hour. If I don't get anything an hour, I'll send it to another one. I'll wait another hour. Usually I don't have to wait that long unless I get out of the office and then I'll switch to somebody else. Um, but in one, in a case, I'll, you know, if you, especially if you, you do like a survey for example and say, hey, after you feel this, you'll get a $10, you know, thing sent to your, your corporate mailbox or something like that. People will do it very quickly and you have the ability to entice them uh, for urgency. So those are all key ones. The initial intrusion is the most important part. For us in the security industry, um, this is a bit problematic because this is the, the part that we don't detect very well. So the initial intrusion itself, if I'm deploying commoditized things like malware and stuff like that, okay, maybe, but most intrusions in the initial breach part don't get detected. And, uh, and I'll show you a couple examples of that. That's the, the, the most critical part for us uh, to, to actually go and detect. But there are a number of other phases that we do as attackers um, that we need to start detecting better on before we actually get access to a lot of the data. There's a, I think the Verizon Data Breach Report had a stat that it takes a few hours to get access into a company and a few days to get to the, the systems that you need to exfiltrate the data. So you basically have a few days of a window to identify where you have to, you know, where an attacker's at. Other than that, you're going to lose all the data that you have. So you get the initial intrusion, um, then we establish command and control, lateral movement, moving to different systems until we get access to the data that we want to. Um, and then after that, you know, persistence hooks, making sure we maintain access, um, all that good stuff, exfiltrate the information and then kind of stay low and quiet after that. So here's something I did on, uh, on CNN. And what was interesting about this one is most pen tests that we do today don't necessarily simulate what an attacker is trying to do. Even calling up on the phone isn't traditionally going to happen from an attacker. It's going to be mostly phishing. But if we're going to do phone phishing and we're going to actually call somebody up on the phone, what's the thing that we typically go after? Secretaries, Secretaries okay. HR. HR, good ones, yep. CEOs. CEOs, IT. What about help desks, right? What's the biggest thing that we typically are told to test in, in, as, as assessors? IT. IT, but password resets, right? So hey, can you password reset somebody? That's, that's the, the common one that most people traditionally do. 
Now the problem with password resets is it most, in most cases requires you to have some sort of information about the employee. Employee number, maybe last four of the social, who knows what it ends up being, but there's verification processes that are uh, used. So in order for you to do those, you have to do a lot of uh, analysis on who you're targeting, right? And to say, okay, who's this person, you know, f you know use OSIT to find his birth date, you know, grab the street addresses, pull a social security number, um, do all this stuff so that I can have it all ready to go, and then I find out it's an employee ID, I'm like, oh, okay, you know. So there's a lot of work going into that. But in social engineering, if you can talk to somebody in a way of a normal human being and say, listen, I need help, but you don't have them do anything that's sensitive, that would trigger their minds to say, hey, I need to do something to verify this person, but I say, I just need some help, I can't get to this website, can you help me out? Most people will do that without having to verify who you are. So if you call any organization, you know, and, and you can do things like spoof phone numbers and things like that, right? Everybody knows that, spoof app and all that other good stuff, you can just spoof your phone number, come from inside the company. Um, and then from there you have access to do whatever you want to as long as you don't trigger any type of emotional response around having to challenge somebody or what we're taught to do. So let's go ahead and do this one. What do you think of when I say the word hacker? Some creepy dude in a basement? Well, that's I am a, a creepy dude in the basement, but... What if I told you there's a class of hackers who don't just have social skills, they have more social intelligence than anyone you'll ever meet. I don't David know about Kennedy that, but is one of them. that's fine. He's what's known as a social engineer, or a people hacker. His craft is to dupe you into doing things and sharing information you probably shouldn't. Can I just get your, your, your credit card number? Some use it for illegal activity. In David's case, companies pay that, him to find out if employees are leaving the company vulnerable. He and his team show us how it's done. Step one, spoof his number so it looks like he's calling from inside the company, and then call tech support. Hello, you there? Hello? Hi, Ken, how may I help you? I was wondering if uh, you can, and one thing with this really quick is that uh, we had a company give us permission to go and do it. The thing is, if they said their company name in any way, shape, or form, we had to bleep it out or remove it from the segment. So we had full permission to do this. I didn't just call up a random company and then get shells to their boxes. I would be in jail at this point in time. So. <laughs> Disclaimer. Uh, take a look at a website I'm trying to get to. It's for a uh, big customer thing I'm working on for Monday, and uh, I can't seem to get to the website from my computer. Sure. Uh, what's the website? I'll see if I can get to it. Thanks, man. I really appreciate the help. I mean, it could be a stupid thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really suck with computers, but uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's www. Survey. That's uh, s u r v e y. Dash pro. Dot com. Yeah, I got a prompt to open. I uh, just clicked open, and I'm at the site now. Here's what the IT guy doesn't realize. By clicking that link, he's just given David full access to his computer. Whoa. Okay, that's weird. I just hit it, and it works. It seems like it's working fine now. Awesome. I don't know what you did, man, but I really appreciate the help. Hey, no problem. That was easy. That was it? <laughs> We're on his computer right now. You were able to take take over this this guy's computer within, I would say, like, under two minutes. Under two minutes, yeah. Under two minutes, took over his entire computer. And, and think of it as not just his computer, but it's pretty much a downfall of the entire company. In this case, the company was paid. So this one specifically, I just used the HCA attack factor. And what's funny is I forgot that we used uh, survey-pro all the time for all of our pen tests. So once I did it, I had to burn it. And I couldn't, we can't use that domain name anymore. So if you go there, it's not going to go to anything. But all my pen testers were totally pissed at me, but it's all good. <laughs> now, the HCA attack factor, I'm going to show you really quick. Now, this is how crazy we are in security. Well, hang on. Sorry. It's so loud. Oh, sorry. More Hornsby. So let me just get this ready here real quick. Now what's interesting is, um, you know, it's always a cat and mouse game when you talk about detection capabilities. And what was weird is um, about a week ago, right before uh, Black Hat and DEF CON, or two weeks ago, I was doing a class uh, to teach at Black Hat called Red versus Blue and showing like evasion techniques and stuff like that. And so I always check my stuff to make sure it works ahead of time. And I noticed that uh, the PowerShell injection technique that I wrote called Unicorn uh, was getting picked up by antivirus. I'm like, okay, that's weird. All right, well, whatever, that's cool. Let's figure out how they're doing it. And so I wrote this this chunker that basically chunks it and submits it uh, to to uh, Windows Defender or whatever. The, I have a different lab for all the antivirus uh, vendors, but it submitted it, and I kept chunking up, and it still kept getting flagged and flagged and flagged, and I couldn't figure out why. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, well, the only thing left is just to change something. And so if you look at this code here, here's the code for. Everybody see that? That's the code for uh, the PowerShell injection being code and everything else. But notice here it says dash ENC. That's an abbreviated uh, uh, command for encoded command. Encoded command allows us to pass what's called base64 encoded uh, strings to PowerShell. Now, interesting enough, if you run this whole tool, 
and I paste it here into Windows Defender and I try to run it, it says this script contains malicious content and has been blocked by your antivirus software, okay? If I change dash enc to encoded command, that can't work. Oh hey we get a shell, that's cool, that's awesome, <laughs> fantastic. So that's the stuff we're dealing with, it's ridiculous, right? Um, but anyways, the HTA attack factor is one of my favorite in set. Uh, and I recommend from a defensive perspective, um, blocking HTAs on the perimeter. You shouldn't need to have any use for downloading HTAs on the outside, use your web content software and block them. Um, but here's a good one, so I'll go ahead and use the latest version of set, which I just released. Ooh. So I'm going to go to the social engineering attack vectors. And by the way, um, there's a new module that I actually, it's an old module, but new module now, uh, called SMS spoofing. So what's funny is, uh, when Mr. Robot aired last year for season one, in season one, episode five, Elliot is, um, in Steel Mountain, uh, and he's trying to social engineer a lady to give him access so that he could take down Evil Corp and upload his, his malware and all this other stuff, right? Uh, during that period, they spoof their, uh, some text messages. Uh, to the lady that he's talking to that your husband is in, uh, you know, serious condition at the hospital, you know, call immediately. And so she gets super disoriented and she w moves away and then Elliot goes in and hacks the evil corporate and all this other stuff. Well, they use the social engineer toolkit to do the spoofing of the SMS text messaging and, and do that, right? So originally, uh, the SMS spoof messages stuff was, was I, I took it out like a long time ago. So they're using a super old version in that episode of set. Uh, to spoof the, st the stuff. So like literally right after, um, right after the, uh, the Mr. Robot, I had like 3,000 requests. Hey, where's the SMS spoofing module? Like can I get it back in there? And I really want to use the SMS spoofing module and I finally broke and I added it. Um, so I rewrote the entire SMS spoofing attack vector and it works extremely well. Um, you can spoof from any phone number, any country you want to, uh, to anybody you want to and you can start sending text messages. So I send text messages and it's actually a good story. Uh, Khalil was in class and uh, we were all in class at Black Hat and uh, Adrian is in the back, uh, you know, helping students and things like that. And all of a sudden, I have no idea why, but he's, Adrian starts uh, yelling at the top of his lungs the Star Spangled Banner. In the middle of class, I'm like, what the heck are you doing, Adrian? He's like, dude, you told me to yell the Star Spangled Banner as loud as I could. I'm like, Khalil, I look over at Khalil, he's giggling over there with the, you know. <laughs> See, <laughs> got him good. But uh, so it works very well, um, and it you know obviously you can impersonate anything um, you know from a, from a spoofing perspective, which is really nice. Um, but we're going to go ahead and do the website attack vector number two. We're going to do the HTA attack vector number eight, uh, and then we're going to clone a site. Now I need to know my IP address, so I'm going to grab that real quick. Oops, I messed up. I, I supposed to enter the URL, my bad. Figure if I wrote the tool, I'd probably know which menu to hit, but it's okay. I'll just clone Trusted Tech as an example. Enter my host, the connect back on. I'll just do my interpreter, and it'll generate everything for me. Now, what's nice about this is I would I would normally submit like a website or something like that, right? That make it look believable. I'd register a domain name. I'd get all my pretext ready, but just for demonstration purposes, we'll get going. And the reason I'm showing you this is I want to show you w that when you're doing um, these types of fishes, people don't care what they have to click on as long as they have an end goal. Like for example, if you're going to a survey site to complete a survey, if you say, hey, when you get to the survey, you just hit the open button and then you're all set. As long as it's in the instructions, they will do whatever that you want them to. So we'll go ahead and go over to, to Internet Explorer. Oh, I'm still got my shell open. Huh. So I was going to use Internet Explorer. This is Windows 10. I'm going to go to my IP address. Or whatever. So I go to my IP address. It should load in a second. Internet here is super slow, so so I get a prompt to open. I just hit open. See that prompt? Set open. That was it. And over here we get our shell. That's it. It works great. 
So very easy to set up, very easy to do. Um, it's still loading, it looks like. So I'll take a second to get to, to the next stage, but um, it'll go ahead and, and, and compromise the machine, which is fantastic. So it's super easy to, to build those as long as you have a good pretext. And to be honest with you, you can literally have them download an executable and run it, and they'll still do it as long as you build, you know, the the pretext the appropriate way. Now it doesn't always require. Um, uh, be doing things in the phone as well. You can always do things in physical. Physicals are my, my favorite because you can literally do whatever you want to as long as you have confidence. Like if you have a little bit of confidence, literally you can do anything you want to. Like for example, um, I combined, I just did one recently for, uh, um, what's the okay, I'll just call them a retailer that you can, you know, that has store locations and stuff like that. And so we did some uh, reconnaissance on, on LinkedIn. We saw that there was a person um, that, uh, you know, uh, was kind of like the IT person for that general region. You know, like, so you had a person that would go out into these different locations, you know, the store locations and, and, you know, help them out and stuff. And so we just spoofed their phone number and said, hey, this is Bob. I'm just letting you know that we're going to be sending two consultants out to do network upgrades to your infrastructure so that you have faster bandwidth and all this other stuff. And they're like, oh, cool. You know, I'm like, yeah, but make sure you validate who they are when they get there. You know, ask them for business cards and stuff like that. And I'm like, and they're like, oh, what's the name of the company? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's this. And we made fake business cards and all that. And then you just walk in and they're like, oh yeah, hey, we're supposed to, they don't even check my, my, my business card, which is fine. Um, and then you walk in, they give you right access to the, the to, uh, full access to the back end infrastructure where their entire network switches are at, everything else. And we just sat there for two days and just hacked and stole credit cards. Like it was amazing. <laughs> they're like, hey, do you need anything? You know, what's with coffee or anything? I'm like, yeah, coffee would be great. You know, thanks. You know, I mean, <laughs> you guys are so nice here. It's amazing. It's so friendly. So. But the physical ones are always interesting. Now, I, I'm going to show you a video here. I have to warn you, it's a little cheesy because um, it's a local news one that we did. So um, when they, then they say this is Dave Kennedy, former NSA and all this other stuff, it's so cheesy. And so I'm a little bit embarrassed about this one. Um, but it's still a good, good lesson because they sent a producer out um, and the thing is said, hey, we're doing a segment. You know, can you just walk outside? And she didn't know what she was going to do. And so she walked past me and I'm like, oh, and she didn't know I was part of this or anything. I'm like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not from here. Do you know where the, the Quicken Loans Arena is at? I'm going to the Cavs game tonight. And, she, and I'm like, and so I started talking to her and striking conversations. She's like, yeah, hey, I'm supposed to be doing something for a thing. I'm like, no, no, just take a second, you know, blah, blah, I don't know where to go. She's like, yeah, I think it's over there. And then I, you know, swiped her badge and cloned her badge and then walked into the building. And then I like, it was cool because like, I didn't know when you go into like a live studio, like they were like filming me. And I went into a live studio as they're filming. And so you can actually see on the news earlier that me walking in and the, the news anchor crew like looked to the left. <laughs> I'm like, oh shoot, I'm so sorry. I was like, you know, like, not supposed to do that apparently, right? An important security alert. You'll certainly so this is for the RNC stuff, but not it's just during the RNC, but they need it right now. That's right. You know the electronic key cards that we all carry and use to get into most private places in our lives. But what if someone could clone that badge and actually steal your identity without the card ever leaving your pocket? Well, you know we're always investigating, and Megan Hickey had a hacker show us exactly how it's done. Megan, he broke into our station today. He did with permission so that we could see for ourselves. Now you've probably heard of credit card hacks or ATM skimmers. Well, this technology takes it to a whole new level. We all know about proxy marks. Your work, your apartment, your parking lot. For many people, it's the key to their lives. But what if anyone who passed you on the street could steal that key without a single touch? It hits all the tumblers and moves the door up. Yeah, Steal see. that key. See, that, see that guy right there on the right hand side? Um, it was funny is this is not related at all. He's he's part of my Cub Scouts and they were randomly filming in downtown Cleveland and he's of course w works for a federal agency and had his badge just hanging right out there. So I'm sitting there watching the segment and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Rod. I'm like, and so we start, I start called him, started making fun of him for running his badge out or whatever. But. With East and now he's a professional hacker. Or some so cheesy. might say I'm so sorry. burglar. I've walked into a retail shop and actually taken the entire cash register and walked out of the place. Kennedy has worked. That one's the best, by the way. Like you just you like you're, you just walk in like you have a purpose and you just take the cash register like you undr you drill it you know you take it out and you walk out with the entire cash register. And the thing's heavy as hell, right? You're sitting there like, God, this thing's heavy. And you're walking out, people are like looking at you and they're like, keep going. <laughs> put it in your car and you drive off and you're like, got a whole bunch of money in your back of your car. You know, it's just like, it's whatever. For some of the most powerful companies in Cleveland. Financial institutions, you know, manufacturing, uh, you name it. 
hired to steal from them to show their weak spots, even moonlighting as a bank robber. We've gotten into bank vaults and uh, stole a ton of money. But he says the easiest way to one, break too. into an organization is by cloning these. It takes about a half a second uh, to clone somebody's badge, and then now you're that person. Kennedy made his own radio frequency ID cloning device, and he told me plenty Rock of smart. other hackers have done the same. This is the antenna. So we put this him to the test. He hid the device inside this clipboard. We sent an unknowing yeah. producer into the parking lot, and he asked for directions. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, hey, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Watch again and look for the clipboard. Oh, I'm sorry. Next, he makes a beeline for the keypad, and he's in. And Kennedy said this summer's RN... So that was a good one because, um, you know... <laughs> That was a good one because like I didn't know where I was going, what I was supposed to be doing, so I just started walking through the building, and I literally walked into that live segment, and like it, it like jolted them because like and you, it's funny, I, I gotta find it, I gotta find the clip because they're sitting there, and they're talking about some story, or whatever, and then all of a sudden like like that, you know, and they're like I'm like oh I'm I'm sorry, and then I shut the door, you know, I'm like and it, it says live on air, don't go in here and everything, I totally, <laughs> whatever, it's fine. Uh, the bank one was a good one. Uh, I think I've told, told this story before, but um, like uh, it was two years ago, three years ago, uh, Chris Nickerson and I were at DerbyCon, and I had one of those um, uh, electronic cigarettes. Have you seen those, right? You know, I don't smoke or anything like that. We had one because it blows big plumes of smoke or whatever. And so at, at the Hyatt, we got permission, and uh, we started blowing smoke through the cracks of the doors to figure out if you could trigger the motion sensor on our side. And so we were able to do it, and we were actually able to trigger the motion sensor by blowing, you know, um, water vapor in the air and triggering the motion sensor. So I wanted, for the longest time, to do this on a bank job, like a bank, bank branch, because the bank branches are d designed for customers, and so if you can trigger the motion sensor on the one side, you know, the, the door should open up, right? You ever walked out of a supermarket and you walk out, you know, and it sees you and it opens the door? Same thing for this uh, bank branch. So it was like two o'clock in the morning, we had like all of our like crazy, like came, you know, camouflage on and everything else, you know, and we make a beeline for the front door, and I'm sitting there like blowing smoke through the whole thing. The whole like inside of the building now is like completely caked with water vapor, right? And it looks like, a, like a, someone's having a great time inside of this bank at the time, right? <laughs> And I'm sitting there for like 15 minutes, and while I'm doing this, one of our other guys goes around the corner. He's like, hey, I'm going to check the other uh, doors or whatever. And so like 15 minutes go by, and I finally get the thing to trigger, and, mo and the motion sensor door opens up. And so I walk inside, and there's our guy just sitting on the, the counter, like saying, like, hey, it took you long enough. I'm like, hey, what, how'd, you, how'd you get him? Like, did you lock somewhere else? He's like, no, the side door was open, dude. I'm like... <laughs> it's always the easy stuff, right? We did a PCI pen test recently, um, and this one was interesting because uh, we ended up phishing one of the main IT admins, which is great. Um, you know, with IT admins, you, you, you can't do things that um, would trigger suspicion with them because what ends up happening um, is, you know, they, they are very technical in nature, so if anything is out of the ordinary, like, hey, I'm downloading a virus, they're probably going to know that's a virus, right? Uh, whereas salespeople, it's a different story. So to be very careful going after IT folks. Again, the incentiv uh, incentivized things are really great, um, you know, things that may be issues, um, getting them to, to help other people, establishing communication. Uh, those are all key things that you can do. Um, in this case, we ended up fishing them through uh, um, a health benefits fish, which works very well. And what was interesting is um, once we compromised them, we tried getting access to their PCI data, their credit card data. And their credit card data was heavily segmented off. So if you know, if you did a quick port scan here, you, know, you can see all they had open into the PCI environment was uh, port 22 or SSH. Now it was interesting when um, we logged in uh, to the admin's box, he was only isolated as an in individual machine. We saw that he was SSHing into the PCI environment. Now if you've ever um, uh, used it, there's a, a tool called Pageant, uh, I'm sorry, a Pageant is a, a part of a putty that stores your uh, uh, certificates in memory. And what you can do is you can um, basically use that to communicate over and inject into that to then hijack that session and then get access into the PCI zone. So we just uh, hijacked that, that session, um, added our own public keys to the server, then we were able to log in. Um, and then one thing, the first thing we do when we get into an environment is um, look at the history, which is always great, and we saw some uh, uh, shell files in there for remoting into other systems. So we remoted into the other systems and uh, looked at uh, MySQL. Uh, again, did history again, saw the password used in memory, which great is, is MySQL-U-P. People put the passwords in there, so we can see the password to, my, to MySQL. And then we got credit card data. So very easy attack vector uh, through phishing and uh, didn't take a, a lot of time. So these types of attacks are interesting because they take advantage of what we're supposed to do as humans. So this is going to be a problem that isn't just now. 
it's going to be it's going to continue to move forward as we go along. So if you look at what you know, people are trying to do right now, it's a balance between technology and using technology in a way to prevent users from doing things, but also at the same time, the education piece. Things that are just like phishing examples, like, you know, using things like fish me or whatever, they're great, um, you know, methods of, of awareness for people to try to keep things fresh in their heads. But at the same time, you still have to do testing to see how well and effective your detection controls are, how well you can stop it in the event that somebody doesn't do it. You know, click ratios to me mean absolutely nothing if people don't know how to report an, an issue to the organization. So if I can fish somebody and it's one person, doesn't trigger any, any, any alarms, I now have free reign over that company until you have one indicator of compromise that I have um, as an organization. So those are all things that I typically do um, to, to kind of go through and look at that. So you know, as an industry, we have to start looking at things a little bit better uh, to go through and, and find things that, that work for us in our environments. And who knows what that is? Who knows if it's a combination of technology or anything else? But the types of techniques that we're leveraging right now is still very easy. I mean, Chris, I mean, how long have we been? Is Chris sleeping over there? He's sleeping. He's sleeping. It's fine. No, he's sleeping. No, he's sleeping. Okay. So what? We've been doing this for a while. Um, would you say it's harder, easier, or the same as the past 10 years? Easier? Okay. I'd say for me it's about the same. Yeah. I mean, I'm... I think it's less hardware now and more people. Yep. Yeah. The, and the, the commoditized fishing stuff is great. Again, I, I'm an advocate of getting, getting awareness out to people and, and kind of being able to benchmark that. But those statistics are irrelevant in a, a security program. I mean, if somebody clicks a little bit less, that's great. But at the same time, the types of techniques that we leverage, you know, and if we develop a very good fish, you still have to have detection capabilities to actively go and, and detect that. So, you know, that's some things that I, I really recommend uh, focusing on. I've got 10 minutes left. Good job. That's a good sign. That's awesome. Um, one last thing I want to show you, and, and I've showed this many times before. Um, so if you haven't, if you've seen it before, I apologize. If you have seen it, uh, that's cool. But I like showing the Katie Couric one as a good example because that one was one of my favorites uh, to go and do. Um, is, is anybody not, has anybody not seen the Katie Couric one before? Okay, we got quite a few people, okay? So this, um, by the way, this is Big Dave, and this is Little Dave. I've lost about 116, 117 pounds, um, so thank you, thank you. Thank you. It's all the, uh, the frantic coding that I do in set, the, uh, the muscles and stuff, it, it, works, it works it out quite a bit, uh, it's been great. But um, in, this, in this specific example, um, what was great about it is, you know, Katie Couric uh, called me and it was funny because I actually happened to be on a physical pen test and I was like literally in um, a uh, uh, air conditioning vent, like climbing through the air conditioning vent. And I'm a big dude at this time, like, so I'm like all sweaty and like, like it's horrible and I'm, like, it's all hot up in there because the air conditioning's not on, it's like the weekend, they turn it off on the weekend. I thought it would be a good idea and it'd be nice and cool climbing through air conditioning vents. Um, but she called me and, and I left the phone on and I'm literally right above the security guard and the phone starts to ring, and so I'm like trying to get to, and you can hear me like cussing and stuff like that. And I can't imagine the security guard's like, "What in the?" <laughs> didn't say anything though. I just kept like whatever. And once it was quiet, he didn't hear a thing, and I just kept going on my way. Everything was fine. But uh, and, but I answered the phone. I'm like, "Hey, can I can I call you back? It's kind of a bad time right now, you know." <laughs> but I'll call you back. Just give me like five minutes. I'm almost in this building. And she's like, "Okay." But uh, the producer. Um, but she wanted me to hack into somebody live in the audience. And what she asked was like, hey, can you just randomly select somebody in the audience and hack them? I'm like, yeah, if I want to go to jail, that'd be cool, right? <laughs> so what I need is, is permission first. And so they gave us permission. Um, and what we did is um, I did a little bit of reconnaissance on the individual I was targeting and went after her in that way. So this is, this is the, the, the one here. Schmidt is here. She has two teenage daughters. She lives in Connecticut. And Stephanie, I understand that you believe your computer is unhackable. Why? Well, uh, I'm, it's something that's really on my mind. I'm very concerned about it. I, I feel like all of my antivirus software is up to date. I've taken a lot of precautions. Oh, I have yeah, that AB. a computer consultant who comes into my home. By the way, did you hear that? She has a computer consultant that comes in her home. Does anybody here know of anybody that has a computer consultant that comes in her home one a year? I'm like, Katie just picked like the most secure person in the world here, and I gotta, I gotta whip out some O-Day stuff right here, you know? And, uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't need to, which is good, but, uh, but no. She literally, I mean, I, I'm the IT consultant for my entire family, especially like, like my grandfather who gets like, like infected every other week. <laughs> I now do all of the, uh, the IT work for our church. Like, I mean, you know, so like I, I'm, like, I'm the IT consultant for like everybody in our entire family, which is fine. I'm cool with that. I just lock them down so they can't do anything. 
Like, hey, I need to get email. No, you don't. <laughs> Mm-mm. Just keep doing Pokemon. You're good. To check on these things. And so I really feel strongly that, that we have done everything that possible to try and protect my, myself and my daughters. I mean, it's something that's really worrisome for me. Well, that, that's very impressive because you seem like you're extremely ahead of the curve. So we decided to put David to the test to see if your comfort level with your security is actually warranted. Tell us what happened. How did you do when we gave you the challenge of... I'm just going to keep that. Dude, that's blue steel, man. That's blue steel all the way. I'm just... Whatever. Well, what's funny is uh, um, during the actual live TV segment, it isn't sure in this one, but uh, um, for just a split second, uh, the per person that was coming up next was Benedict Cumberpatch, the guy that plays Doctor Strange and you know uh, Sherlock and all that other stuff. And so I was in, I was in uh, totally fanboying for him, like before the segment started. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Benedict Cumberpatch. He's like, oh my god, it's Dave Kennedy. He didn't really say that, but um, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I was talking to him, and I guess when I was on TV, um, it said, up next, one of the world's sexiest men alive. And it had literally like this picture up here like this. <laughs> and they removed the up next for like a split second. And of course, all the hacker people were like, oh, yeah, the world's sexiest man alive and all this other stuff. So <laughs> it's pretty hot. It's pretty hot. Hacking into Stephanie's computer. So, you know, Stephanie, I would say, was actually one of the, the top 5% of what I would say is being most secure. Um, you know, everything up to date, really locked down, all of those good things. And um, so I literally had plugged in, opened my computer up, and less than 10 minutes or so had a fully designed uh, website that looked real in every way and shape or form of a website that you would visit every single day. And I sent an email out, and uh, as soon as I sent the So I, um, I uh, friended a bunch of her Facebook friends, and then I friended her. And then I, because, you know, established a little bit of credibility and then friended her. And then I saw that she would order things like packages on Amazon. So I just created an Amazon website that looked like Amazon. I'm like, hey, your package is going to be arriving tomorrow. Click here to update your settings or blah, blah, blah. And it's okay. Click, click. <laughs> uh, looks very believable in every way. Uh, she clicked a link. Um, and then from there, again, less than 10 minutes of setup time and hacking and all that stuff, I had full access uh, to her computer, uh, her webcam, got around all of her antivirus, everything completely. You are kidding me. Wow. So tell us oh some my of the gosh. things that you were able to see. Well, the first thing we did is we, we enabled her. Oh my uh, God, that's my. We enabled her webcam, and we were actually able oh to monitor gosh. everything that was going on in her house, everything from her daughter uh, working on her computer uh, to Stephanie oh actually God. walking through the house itself. Uh, we actually enabled the audio as well, so we could actually hear everything that was going on at the same time, uh, so we could listen to conversations. Um, from there, you know, we started looking at um, a lot. She was pissed. <laughs> She's really cool, actually. She's really cool. She uh, afterwards, you know, asked a bunch of questions on how to protect her computer and everything. And I, you know, every, I, I think the last time I talked to her was like six months ago or whatever. But uh, she's awesome, uh, you know. And the whole thing was just to, you know, kind of show exactly what was happening out there. So, you know, it is easy today. Um, but you know, what's interesting to see is that we are taking this seriously. And what's nice to see is like this room here would not have been packed ten years ago. You know, it's cool to see people getting interested in this and social engineering as a, as a profession and the awareness that's happening with it. What the best fix is, I don't know. I, none of us have figured that out yet. There's no tool or product they can download that stops all the APTs, although some apparently claim they can stop 99%, which is bullshit. But, um, you know, you have things that you can do to protect yourself. Um, and it's really that, that defense and depth strategy of being able to identify, you know, where your weaknesses are and try to minimize your damage. And again, to that initial thing around, you know, the red team needs to be right 100%. That is changing. The defense needs to be right just once to identify that a breach has actually occurred. The commoditized malware stuff, that's essentially just noise for us at this point in time. But being able to detect when a compromise occurs and the methods and techniques that attackers use to move to different systems, to get access to the data they need access to, that's the part that we need to mature at as an industry. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions at all? What's that? The lady fire consultant. I, hey, it was Windows, man. I can't blame him. So. <laughs> Question back there? It's a good question. So the, the question was to emphasize, you know, what can you do aside from training to stop these types of techniques? Is that good paraphrasing? Yeah. So the, the thing is, is that, okay, 
you, you train your employees, which is good. That's, that's what we need to do. Bringing awareness not only helps from them not clicking on things, but also awareness when you implement things in security that, that may be restricted. They understand why you're doing it. So you're no longer that draconian you know, security folks. You have the best interest of them to protect. But we have to do more real world simulations of these attacks. Like, hey, I'm going to do a targeted fish and we're going to make it successful you know, and we're going to see what we detect and what we don't. So we call more of a purple team uh, type situation where we have folks in the defense and folks on the offense working together to figure things out to get better at defense. And you know what? Every increment that you do of those, you get better and better and better at detection each time. And a good example of that is uh, we were doing an assessment for a company three years ago. And it was the first purple team engagement that they had done. And you know, real poor defenses, didn't detect anything. But their goal was to get to the point to where they detected a breach within three weeks. That was their goal. So and it might sound horrible, but if you look at all the other ones, it's like six months to like a year before they actually detect things. So I, I'll give them three weeks, whatever. Um, so we get to, th to, to three weeks. Well, next time we went there, it took them three weeks. They detected us after three weeks. Before the, the year we came after, they wanted to go down to a week. Now we're at a day. They do very good at defense based on these simulations going on all the time to get better and better at detection. So it's a pairing of understanding the offensive ways that we attack organizations and putting controls in to detect that as well as the training. I mean, you're never going to get perfect, but I mean, I hope they trip up once or twice and I put things out there that make the attacker go after things that allow me to, to detect that as is actually happening in our environment. So that's the most important piece. Yeah. Will morality ever catch up to technology? Um, you mean people being more moral with what they do? God, no, no way, no. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I think, I think there's enough money to get um, people enticing to keep doing things. Um, I think that the, the market itself continues to go up um, when it comes to this, and there's a lot of money to be made. So I don't think, uh, I think we'll, we'll somehow become more conscious and not do things and harmful things to people. I don't know. World peace, I hope for. Aha, something huge I'm coming up with next year. I did a tweet and I said, hey, next year I'm going to be releasing something huge. That's it. That's all I can tell you. So. <laughs> it's a new framework that I'm working on that uh, will break almost everything. But, but it needs to happen so that we can get better. What the heck is that? Oh, okay. Well, hey, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much.